have a, a great speaker and someone I've heard before and really enjoyed. This is Karen Bolin. Karen is the founding director of the Life Compass Institute and head of Montrose School. She's recognized as a thought leader in the field of character and ethics education. Director Emerita and senior scholar at Boston University's Center for Character and Social Responsibility, co-architect of the National Schools of Character program, Dr. Bolin has served as advisor on character education, both nationally and internationally. Uh, a sabbatical fellow at the Jubilee Center, an editorial reviewer and contributor to the Journal of Character Education and the Journal of Education at Boston University. She's also an author and a contributing author to several books, including, and I, I love this one, Teaching Character Education Through Literature, Awakening the Moral Imagination, Building Characters in Schools, and Happiness and Virtue, beyond East and West toward a global, new global responsibility. Great titles. An important focus of her work in both the higher education and K-12 education is the development of practical wisdom in school leaders and teachers. I could not be happier to have been able to bring her to Brookfield Academy, even if it's only by Zoom. So please join me in welcoming Karen Bolin. Thank you for being here, Karen. Thanks for having me, Linda. And it's so good to see so many parents this morning. And I'm sure um, good colleagues of, of Linda, I wish I could have been dying to visit Brookfield Academy. I'm inspired by your mission, your, your great work, your commitment to excellence in teaching. We too here at Montrose for grades six through 12. Um, we are open full-time in person and like you have had a heroic um, faculty and staff team who have pivoted with great agility and such commitment to the students because we know that being with them in person um, and exploring these great texts and questions about what it means to be human uh, and developing all these habits of mind of good mathematicians and scientists and linguists is um, is so fundamental to building the kind of resilience needed in um, navigating a pandemic um, at home, in school, and living solidarity with the West, rest of the world as we watch Absolutely. this situation evolve. So I'm really honored to be with you all. Um, I think that um, this beautiful image, which um, some of you may have seen in the Vatican, Raphael's School of Athens, just reminds us um, that the work we do inspires all. We could spend all day in front of this painting alone. Um, and I, I could do not claim to be an expert in classical education. I am a, a veteran educator, I'm deeply committed to what endures, what matters, what points us towards what it means to flourish and thrive as human beings. And, we are a school deeply rooted in a Judeo-Christian um, tradition uh, and the liberal arts tradition. And so there's a lot of overlap with classical education. So I wanna walk you through a few things. And every time I have a Zoom presentation, this analysis is funny. <laughs> so what are we aiming at in classical education? I'm gonna use as my inspiration today, some great classical thinkers. Um, uh, to help define what we mean by classical education, what we're aiming at, what we're not aiming at, some of the challenges we face as parents and educators, and you parents are the first and most important educators of your children. So your partnership with the school, your partnership, your interests in what feeds your sons and daughters' minds, hearts, and character, the rich curriculum and experience they have in school really matters because the conversation continues at home um, and you can take um, each of your children to deeper places. So um, classical education, when we think about what are we aiming at, if we take Aristotle's scale, he has the doctrine of the mean, he says that when we are aiming at what's best and right, what allows us to thrive and flourish, and we're aiming at our best response to something, it's a, it's a high point 
um, it's a choice that falls between two extremes, one extreme of excess and the other extreme of deficiency. So the deficiency of um, when we think about classical education, we don't want our children to be ignorant. We don't want them to be um, uninformed of this great cultural patrimony, tradition, and heritage we have as, as human beings. Um, on the other extreme, we don't want to reduce classical education, liberal arts education, to cultural literacy simply as a form of elitism, snobism, superior, superiority. We're aiming at something um, much higher, and that being, um, is this idea that we'll be exploring in the context of this talk, um, and it's, it will it will emerge shortly. Bear with me as you. Um, it, classical education and character education um, combined, which is the education of the whole person, mind, heart, will, um, in an understanding of human excellence. What does it mean to be human, to flourish? And this is our uh, this is our goal. And when I think about character education and classical education, I'm rem reminded of this great story by a dear friend of mine, Kevin Ryan, he talks about when he was in college and uh, up late in the middle of the night talking about what is the meaning of life. And he and his friend were back and forth. This, of course, was after the discussions about the parties and, and people they had met and the fun they had had. And it had gone to this existential place. Um, and, you know, his friend said, you know, I, I think um, the meaning of life is is a lot like making your life a work of art, um, seeing our lives the way Michelangelo saw that slab of marble. It was a defective large slab of marble with a serious fissure in it from which the David emerged. And um, as an artist, he saw the potential and that tremendous masterpiece emerged from it. And yet it's not just what the artist the parent, the teacher does to, to the stone, to chisel it. It's also, it's how we evoke from our children, from our students, the greatness, the agency, the freedom, and the potential they have to make their lives a work of art, to become the best version of themselves. And so it's, it's this dual effort of providing the great raw material um, having that conviction of the, of the greatness within them, and then evoking their sense of agency, their habits, their dispositions to lead a life um, uh, in, in those great themes, those great themes that classical education, liberal arts education addresses, which is pursuing what's, what's true and, and distinguishing truth from falsehood and pursuing what, what's what's good and noble and distinguishing that from the ignoble um, and pursuing what's beautiful and distinguishing that from what is is not beautiful or ugly. Or, so these ideals are created in combination of the relationships we have with young people and what we feed them, the, the, the material we work with, the content of the curriculum, what we read, what we study, what we experience together in the classroom. And so I'm not going to linger here very long. Um, we know that in the classical tradition, the liberal arts tradition, there are the languages that pertain to the formation of our mind, how we develop those habits of mind that enable us to pursue truth, to become deliberative and thoughtful and practically wise, not just impulsive and reactive. And so the study of grammar and understanding symbol and language, this is not just in, in writing grammar and literature, but it's also in um, world languages and classical languages and rhetoric and speech, poetry, um, drama, um, and then of course, you know, philosophy and logical thinking and argument are such an important part of a classical education and all of these habits are built through the tremendous teaching of your faculty, of my faculty, and what we choose to feed 
um, our students in terms of texts and topics and great questions. And then there are the arts that pertain to, to, to number, to order, to patterns um, that, that help us develop those, those habits of mind to see numbers and time and space and space, time and relation um, and, and to see things from a number of different perspectives. And all of this mental agility is, um, is built not only in our math classes, but in our interdisciplinary projects and in, and in science. And it's all about helping our um, sons and daughters, our students um, thrive intellectually. So they develop the kind of agility that keeps them in awe of, of nature and reality, but also helps them to be the kind of responsible professionals who, when building bridges, take very seriously um, the mathematics and the engineering because they've developed those habits of, of thoughtfulness and carefulness and inquiry. We have some challenges in our culture, um, and you as parents of young people know that um, while we have tremendous good, we're not Luddites in social media and technology is a tremendous tool. Part of what a classical education does is help us to realize we choose how we use these tools and we choose how we engage with other human beings um, in the electronic landscape, the virtual landscape, um, and in the real world of families, um, classrooms, athletic fields. Um, we are who we are, um, the same person in private and in public. And that is a lesson of, of character and integrity. And what the challenge is for, for us with a, a medium like social media is that it practices um, reductionism, like quick, facile labeling, stereotyping. Sometimes it's just cheerful symbols, but it reduces emotions to emojis complex um, relationships and discussions to posts. And we have to battle this reductionism, um, this quick um, cancel culture, again, with the power of our relationships with young people and relationships with the texts and topics we put before them, because that's fundamental to help them see that human life is nuanced. And we learn the most from people in dialogue with them and understanding their story, understanding their tradition, their family, where they come from, their faith tradition, their cultural background, why they think what they think. Um, and in working together, um, solving problems together, creating great shows together, working on science projects together. So, so there's so much in great literature, and this is science fiction, 20th century, um, but it's worth rereading Ray Bradbury, uh, Fahrenheit 451. And we're reminded in this, um, in this great short piece of science fiction where books are being burned, um, there must be something in books, things we can't imagine to make a woman, there's a woman staying in her house because she doesn't want to part with her library. There must be something there. You don't stay for nothing. Um, and so when I speak about books in a top, the context of classical education, I'm speaking of, of um, broadly, not only of great literature, which of course a classical education acquaints young people with, but also all the great core texts um, that students experience in, in science, math, and, and in language. And the reason we choose to engage our students in a liberal arts education at Montrose, the reason you choose to engage your children in, in a classical education at Brookfield Academy is because you know there are questions, topics, um, such thoughtful, enduring, themes and narratives that you want to acquaint your children with so that they can learn to grow and flourish and what it means to be human. And speaking of what it means to be human, um, I just want to acknowledge um, the beauty and messiness of, of education and upbringing. Uh, for you as parents, it's your most noble vocation to raise your children. There's no guidebook for it. Um, it's very challenging. You need each other. You have the grace. Um, and the wisdom um, from society, from culture, from God to carry out this, this noble work. Um, and we know it's it's super messy. Um, children are, 
our artists, their works in progress, we are all works in progress. And that's really quite hopeful. Neuroscience reminds us that we can build new habits, new patterns, new neural pathways late in life into our 70s and 80s. We can learn languages. And that means we can also build our character, um, refine our viewpoints, grow in wisdom and understanding of the world of reality of each ourselves and of each other. So this is a very hopeful enterprise, classical education and character education. And just um, very briefly, I'm deeply inspired by a mentor, Steve Tigner, uh, who was a former director of the National Endowment of the Humanities years ago, and he taught at Boston University, taught a course called Cultural Foundations for Educators. And he reminded us of this, this magnificent painting is in the Metropolitan in New York, if you have a chance to, to visit. And it's Aristotle contemplating the bust of Homer. And what does this have to do with classical education and character education? Well, Aristotle, as you know, is the great philosopher who really thought deeply about what it means to flourish, who really helped us define what we mean by virtue as, as human excellence. Um, and Aristotle taught, um, he was the teacher for Alexander the Great, sorry, and I think you can see the medallion right here of Alexander. Um, and Aristotle is also contemplating in his hand on the, this sculpture, this work of art, the, the bust of Homer. So this is a story of three teachers inspired by each other and inspired by each other's work. Um, Alexander the Great, the military strategist, um, learned from um, Aristotle was, was his great um, tutor and inspiration as a philosopher. Alexander the Great slept with Homer's um, under his pillow and consulted Homer regularly to get insight on military strategy and execution. And um, I'm sorry, I, I have misspoken here. So Alexander is inspired by Homer's epic narrative verse. And as I said, he's slept with him under his pillow. Um, and, and then we have this other teacher connection between Aristotle and um, and Alexander the Great. And Aristotle represents sort of the life of the mind of philosophical contemplation, you know, thinking about what things are and why they matter, or what Aristotle would call theoretical wisdom. Um, and uh, Alexander the Great thought more about the practical wisdom. How do we take wise action in context, military strategy, leadership, day-to-day -day life. And Homer represents that productive wisdom. What, what can we do, create, or produce? And Homer created this lasting and enduring, magnificent um, epic verse that inspires us about what it means to be human with in incredible narratives. Um, so even in the artifacts and art, the classical tradition, you can, there's such rich wisdom to be to be mined um, and that schema of understanding theoretical knowledge um, practical knowledge and productive knowledge is very relevant in school because in a classical education liberal arts education our teachers our schools by our very mission are making choices about um, what kind of knowledge and texts um, matter to help your sons and daughters become the best versions of themselves. And then they, we are modeling by example in, in every relationship and in every assignment, um, the kind of habits of mind and practical decision-making they make in math class and music and history. Um, and then all of their assignments, what they do produce and perform, um, helps them grow in that productive wisdom. So that's really the richness of a liberal arts classical education is you know your child has access to these three types of wisdom. But then there's a deeper um, anthropology and psychology. Again, I'm taking my cue from um, Plato's Republic 
and from my um, wise mentor, Steve Tigner, who pulled out these instructive insights for, for educators. Um, in Plato's Republic, there's this great metaphor of justice in the city. And he says, in order to understand justice in, in the soul, excuse me, in order to understand justice in the city, we need to understand justice in the human soul or psyche. And he explains that there are three seats of motivation in the human soul that need to be brought into harmony, into justice. And the first seat is our appetite, which desires to be fed, to have fun, to be satisfied. We're hungry. Um, when, we, when we need to watch a movie after a tired week, we just, we seek um, fun, satisfaction. Um, we also have the spirited part. This is not spiritual. This is spirited. Think animated. Think Olympics, being on a team. This is the seat of our emotions, the desire to achieve, to belong, to be recognized by name, to be encouraged, to be moved and inspired by beautiful music and great narratives. Um, we, we need uh, to feed the spirited part of the soul. And then our reason also has great desires. Our reason desires to know, we see this in two-year-olds from a very young age who are asking all the time, why, why is it getting dark out? Why are there no stars tonight? Why does the sun rise at this time? Why, why, why? Um, why is it getting lighter even though it's colder? And um, the reason wants to know to figure out, to be instructed and to be informed. So these three seats of motivation are really three seats of desire. And the best education feeds all three, not just one, not just, it's not just a cerebral exercise. The best education feeds our reason, our mind, our, our emotions, our heart, our ambitions, um, and feeds our appetites. It, uh, and, and Augustine put it this way, and it's a very simple adage, and he was preparing young ministers to go out and preach. And he said, always remember when you are teaching or preaching these three aims, to delight, to instruct, and to move. And classical education and character education seeks to delight young people's appetites. So they develop an appetite for what's true, what's good and beautiful, um, and give them experiences in school, which make them want to come to school. And our students are so grateful to be coming into school every day in this pandemic. Um, and the experiences that motivate them, that inspire them, that edify them, rich narratives, biographies, um, and obviously um, the kind of, of writing, problem solving um, that gets them in the zone and has them transfixed and taps into their sense of intellectual curiosity and wonder. And so we talk a lot in our culture about nutrition, diet, and exercise. We've learned about its impact on our sleep, our mental health, and our, our, men our mental health and wellness and our ability to learn. And what we really need to be thinking about equally is what is the content? What is the food? And what are we feeding our young people's appetite, spirit, and reason? And how are we inviting them to exercise their mind, their spirited heart, and their appetite? Because the challenge we face as a culture um, you know, and as adults is when we our ambition alone, our spirited part alone, blindly calls the shots and think about Macbeth's um, ambition for power, think of white collar crime, think of road rage. Um, when these three parts are not fed and in harmony with sort of reason guiding, um, blind ambition, infatuation, can call the shots and this is when we see behavior that's impulsive um and and this is and this is obviously natural um and it takes parents and educators working together giving feedback coaching and correction because we care to help um young people and help adults not rationalize our ambition so that we justify cheating stealing by violence or any kind of abuse of power so when our decisions are unchecked by this balanced harmony with reason wisely captaining our spirited part and our, our 
appetite, um, we run this risk. Similarly, if we sit, and this happens in, in the pandemic, I'm sure you saw the students come back different amounts of time and exposure to social media or disconnection from peer, it took its toll. Um, too much time just doing um, things that are not constructive or productive make it harder to get back in shape and focus. And so when we see this again, adults and children, when our appetite is dominant, it colors our ambitions and it colors our reason and we rationalize bad choices and we just seek pleasure or whim. Think of Pinocchio in Pleasure Island, just doing whatever he pleases. Um, and so the goal to delight, instruct, and move all three so that students come to appreciate what's worth develop an appetite for um, great uh, works of art, great work, great ways to spend their time. And it's so interesting, this whole thing of classical education, liberal arts education, um, the choices we make matter. And Mark Twain once said, um, the man who doesn't read good books has no advantage over the man who can't read them. You know, what we feed, um, what we feed our students is significant. And so uh, again, what are we aiming at? Well, Plato tells us it's harmony of soul where um, the reason is wisely guiding and shepherding, um, not dominating, but wisely guiding and shepherd, shepherding our ambitions and our desires, um, wisely guiding and shepherding our appetites. Um, I call it in um, my work on teaching literature and the moral imagination, the schooling of desire, that really our job as educators is to help young people fall in love, um, that their ambitions, their appetites acquire a taste for only the good, the true, the beautiful, and engaging in activity that is productive, constructive, and makes a contribution to their families, their peers, and society. And what's the aim for that? You know, what is the doing that helps us thrive? That's virtue. And again, the etymology, vir, Latin, strength, agency, manliness. Uh, but agency means freedom. It means something that's not done to you, but something we do. And it's a strength from within. The Greek erite is activity in accord with human excellence. So virtue is a disposition. It involves choice and freedom. It's not mindless. It's distinctly human. Virtues are always good. They're good habits of mind, heart, and character or will that enable us to flourish under stress, under pressure, and when we have the freedom to do as we please. And those habits, those virtues we develop in school, K through 12, can become dispositions and habits we take to university and into our professional and personal lives. Um, and the goal in school and classical education is to give students as much practice as possible um, developing these good habits. And, and first, we form in young people the moral agency, and they learn by imitation and habit. Um, Aristotle says we, we learn by doing. We practice through um, habit, and we practice good things, whether it's playing a musical instrument um, or our soccer dribble across the field or learning to read well and develop an argument. These, these are learned with practice and habit with learning from mistakes and consulting a teacher and beginning again. That's so very, very important. Um, and then um, as young people get a little bit older, we're simultaneously developing, we're, we're reaching for the development of practical wisdom of the mind of good judgment and so we cultivate in young people their intellectual strengths their intellectual agency and these habits are brought about you know again at home and in school through direct teaching and experience and this is why we think about your first job um, and your best bosses these are people who gave you feedback and coaching who helped you realize that some of the biggest mistakes you made were the most powerful lessons personally and professionally. And that would make you a better boss, supervisor, professional, or friend. And so in the classroom, in school, it's the safest place to be learning from our mistakes and be acquiring and refining those habits of mind that help us deliberate well, plan a longer writing assignment, um, make distinctions between ideas, develop the right 
aim. So this is all happening in the classroom um, and outside the classroom in clubs and activities. <clears throat> But it's really, if we're conscious and deliberate and intentional about it, as we are at Montrose and as you are at Brookfield Academy, we know that every activity is aimed at helping um, these uh, children and young men and women develop these develop good habits. And what happens as a result? I'm just going to share a little bit. In literature, um, we see we can put incredible literature before them. Ode on a Grecian Urn is one of my favorites by Keats. Um, it's a very complex poem and, and talk about enduring classical tradition. It's uh, This poem is two narrative scenes on the side of um, a, a Greek urn. One is a, a funeral dirge and we don't know what happened, why these people had have emptied, emptied this hillside town and have a minister and a calf and are about to make a sacrifice. And there's a funeral procession following suit. Um, and then on the other side of the urn, two lovers are just about to kiss. And there's a piper piping and it's eternally springtime because it's this frozen moment of beautiful spring and um, budding, budding trees. Um, this is, these are images that um, my students drew as we were reading the poem aloud in class and the power of um, rich literature is that it really does have incredible staying power on our imagination and our memory and that experience of, of drawing what we see and what we learn also kind of seals both um, that sense of confidence and competence i can do this i can make sense of a very complex piece of, of literature and draw new and profound insights from it. But I can have great discussions about what's going on here. Why did this artist choose to paint these two scenes on this one vase? Why is this poet lingering on this and asking us to think the truth is beauty and beauty is truth? That's all one needs to know. And all of these concepts and images give rise to bigger questions about what it means to be human and what's important um, in, in, in life. Um, and this leads to joy in and out of the classroom because you're, you're tackling big topics together. Also in literature, just in um, a discussion of Pride and Prejudice, uh, the students had looked at the difference between personality and character. And personality, like temperament, is part of our core DNA, what we, in, what we inherit. Um, we might be um, like any one of us, the seven dwarfs um, or a combination of them. Those temperament and personality qualities um, are, are just part of what gives us our color. Our character are those habits we shape and form deliberately and purposely about how we treat each other, how we respond to challenges, the choices we make under stress and pressure and when no one else is looking. And this um, this is from a, a passage identification on a test. And Elizabeth Bennett is reading a letter from her aunt, which is getting a fuller account of Darcy after Elizabeth is convinced that Darcy is self-righteous um, and, and arrogant. Lizzie reads this letter, which is revealing that Darcy is a noble character, treats his servants well, is kind, reads this letter in utter amazement because she had never imagined Darcy doing something like this. It seemed completely against his personality as she understood those external characteristics of personality. However, she distinguishes it is within his character. So this sophomore has understood the difference that his character is deeper he could, he's the kind of person who can make choices. Darcy achieved the ability to get the better of himself, his personality quirks, and resolves his internal conflict of struggling against his pride and prejudices. So these are the kinds of insights that are so important to any relationship, to parenting, to managing, to leading corporations, to being a, a, um, a good friend and community member that are so important. And every subject, um, is an invitation to develop these kinds of habits of mind and character 
that um, nurture a love for the truth, um, a desire to make sense of patterns in life, symmetry, order to discover, um, uh, to discover beauty, to make sense of things, and to use our mind and intellectual faculties really well. This is so much fun because a colleague of mine was doing a project just to kind of, you know, break up the pandemic blues um, and had her students use functions and equations in, in algebra to to create art. And they did this these masterful um, assignments. You know, it was it was always great to to build these interdisciplinary connections and see how much and, and what they can do with formulas to create um, to create a, a piece of art. Also, we take advantage of our wetlands on campus. Our, our students create field guides. They label the flora on the fauna. They use the Latin and the English. Um, and each year they um, create pieces of work that will be useful as we um, pave the way to creating a, a footpath and working working with the local conservation commission. Um, again, this this text is is nature, but those habits of mind, paying attention, observing, um, connecting back to what they're learning in science class. Um, last year, um, the art and science uh, class was inspired by uh, Alexander Calder. He's a sculptor, and the the students wanted to um, engineer, they engineered kinetic sculptures of, of geese. Um, and they looked at the, the migration formation. And um, it, what's interesting is that in this long hallway, they even hung the exhibit in such a way that if you followed it with your eye, the viewer would be on a path from our arts and environment building um, directly out to the wetlands outdoors. So um, connecting the engineering, the art, the science, you can also see across the top here um, a DNA molecule. And then she uses all sorts of physics and um, theories of, of light here to combine art and science. And I, it's very powerful and I'm not doing it justice and I want to um, be mindful of time. But when um, young people are acquainted and engaged in all of the wonders of, of, of our natural world and the principles of, of physics and science, they are inspired to do great things. And we're very proud. Um, a team was just published in um, Biotrex Science Journal. And um, it was very exciting, exciting for them. So mathematics science, art, op numerous opportunities just to build connections and increase their sense of, of awe and wonder and curiosity. Um, I love the movie A Man Called Infinity. It's a great film if you're trying to jumpstart your child's interest in math. I highly, highly recommend it. So all of these habits, open-mindedness, precision, perseverance, academic integrity, diligence, analysis, discipline, these are all virtues. These are all human excellences um, that are acquired um, in the classroom when we troubleshoot, when we begin again, when we spend time in that pain point. That pain point is really important. Remember, I talked about nutrition and exercise. And when we're injured and we need to see the physical therapist, we have a personalized plan of physical therapy because there's an area that's weak. There's an area that there's pain. We need to work through it with guidance. And so pain and frustration aren't bad in and of themselves. What matters is what is our, what is our personalized learning plan so that we keep at it and we build strengths where there's weakness. Obviously too, um, the mind, the heart, I spoke earlier about the spirited part, the ambitions, the seat of emotion, the desire for inspiration. There's so much in story, in children's story, that is just replete with virtues of, of friendship, 
of Pepe the Light, Light Lamp Lighter. It's all about the importance of work and details and taking care of little things and being faithful to your small job. The Empty Pot is all about integrity, keeping your word, being, um, being true to your promises. Um, beautiful, beautiful pieces. Um, art, history, and narrative help us make distinctions that are so important. Justice versus exploitation. Um, courage versus um, recklessness, hero versus a celebrity. So powerful when we spend time in the classroom and at home. Do ask your sons and daughters, tell me about, tell me what you're reading. Tell me about that. Walk me through a favorite scene. Keep it very open-ended to help hear their reflections. And while these are teaching resources, um, these are great resources for home. Um, Great Lives Vital Lessons is about biographies that are inspirational. Um, teaching character through literature, how do we discuss literature at home and in the classroom? A tremendous resources for parents and educators in here. Similarly, in Happiness and Virtue, a lot of wisdom from the Eastern tradition. Um, this was a project that I did with colleagues from Japan. So we paired nine virtues. Um, we and we we have we would have a pair of stories, one from an Eastern tradition, one from a Western tradition, that illuminated those virtues. And this is very much a a discussion at home book that you can read stories together as a family and discuss them. And new and available on our website is stress tests of character. Um, I'll be sure that Linda sends you all the PDF. Um, and it's it's all about the power of narratives. Stories, for example, of great scientists whose struggles were instrumental in their growth as a scientist and in making major discoveries and contributions to the field. There's tremendous research that shows that when young people know that professionals in different fields have struggled, particularly scientists, it inspires them to um, be more engaged in science and trust their own struggle and the power of their struggle. So stress test is about the power of leveraging and reframing difficulties, stressors as opportunities for growth. And how can we do that in a way that delights, instructs, and moves so that we're feeding the mind, the spirited part, and the appetites. Um, so it's a very valuable um, resource again for short stories. There's personal stories in it and ideas for what you can do um, at home. So with that, I want, I'm mindful of time and I want to leave space for um, questions. Uh, but just to, to summarize, really, that this beautiful mission at Brookfield Academy, this commitment to educating the character of your sons and daughters, educating them in feeding them in this great classical tradition, the same way we feed our students in this great liberal arts tradition, is about evoking from them virtue, these habits of excellence. It's about inspiring them um, and empowering them with the habits and strengths um, they need to be human, to be great friends, sons and daughters, classmates, citizens of the world, um, and professionals. And in every subject, what is it um, that we're looking at? The habits and strengths of great mathematicians, scientists, historians, writers, linguists, thinkers, these are what they're able to develop in the classroom when they do their homework and work with you. Um, and it's that great teaching um, at home. How, how can I help cultivate their appetites? How can I nurture their desire for this great content and even for hard work, knowing that it culminates in tremendous contributions? Um, that's what it's all about um, for us, you know, Montrose. These are our habits of mind that help us achieve veritas, the pursuit of truth. Um, these are our habits of heart that help us achieve great friendships, relationships, teamwork, citizenship. And these are the habits of character that help us deal with those stress tests um, when we're under pressure and helps us deal with those leisure tests when no one's looking. What are the habits we need? I know that Brookfield Academy has its own focus. I'm gonna stop here um, and stop sharing my screen um, and invite uh, questions, comments, objections.
I, I was wondering about that stress. What was the one that stress in character? What was the last thing you just talked about? Stress, stress tests, stress, stress tests test. of character. Yes. This year at Brookfield Academy, uh, we have a theme every year. And this year, our theme is embrace challenge. So I'm just thinking, is that a book or a lesson plan or what, what exactly is that? Maybe we Excellent. could. Um, that's a great embrace challenge is right on target with what stress test is helping you to do. It's a resource guide. So it can be used by um, administrators, teachers in the classroom um, and parents at home. And if you flip through it, there's, you know, a little bit on the power. What is a stress test? What is stress? How does it help us build character? So you can do a little uh, discussion with faculty and parents just using those short pieces with researched um, based uh, principles. And then there are a number of, of short readings and activities you can do with students. Um, and so you can, it's designed not as a lockstep curriculum, but as something that can be useful to school administrators, teachers, and parents. And then it does give you a selection of, of stories and resources, as well as some inspirational blog posts that can be modeled. Um, so if you'd like to use it, let us know. And we're also happy to, um, see if you'd like some professional development for faculty on that because it's something else we've we've had a lot of fun doing great we just got a question here in the chat that said um any recommendations for books for graduating seniors oh that's so good well i don't know um your entire reading list so um it, it depends. I mean, there's. I do love Man's Search for Meaning, and if if that's not part of the curriculum, that's that's a great read. Um, the other, and these are all the little. Um, the other one, there's a, there's a, there's several powerful books. Um, uh, even Tuesdays with Maury is a nice contemporary pairing with with um, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, I love the play Wit. Emma Thompson did the film version of it. Um, these are all thematically related, by the way. Uh, and and so is um, Immaculate Illigabiza. What is the name of that? Oh, yeah, that's a great Left to Tell. Left to Tell by Immaculate Illigabiza. So th these are more in endurance stories and what is the meaning of of life, but they're they're powerful stories that um that I know uh, the kid, it resonates. It would move them. Yes, for sure. Those are great titles. Anyone we taught else? with, we taught with, um, and we read uh, selections from the Nicomachean Ethics on the distinction between practical and theoretical wisdom. And it, it went over really well with the kids. Great. Excellent. Was, I don't know how you teach it. That'd be fun to talk about. But um, hey, I had, a, I had a question, if it's OK, Mrs. Breyer. Of course. Um, so like Aristotle, I think um, it's almost like his jaw, like, like, okay, look, Aristotle um, is constitutive of the tradition of which we're members. I, I get that. But it's not like, I don't know if you've ever had like a problem with your jaw where the top and the bottom don't like quite make a fit. <laughs> and so you can get a headache. So kind of thinking about Aristotle's vocabulary, um, I'm not sure how easily it translates to 2021 because um, just to take one example, Aristotle argues and is committed to the idea that it, unless you have all the virtues, uh, in particular, uh, the crowning virtue of uh, book six, uh, phronesis, you have none of them. Um, so he's actually kind of limited in his capacity to uh, talk about moral growth, um, seems to me. Um, or like your word habit. I mean, it seems um, like mindless repetition. Like I, I tie my shoes by habit. And his word disposition though, uh, hexis, it's like, I don't know how to convey that exactly. Um, do you have any advice on, on kind of quite a question. getting yes. beyond Excellent. Aristotle to uh, yeah. a similar vocabulary? Like I look at the Jubilee Center, I think in Birmingham is great, um, but what, what other resources might you recommend? Sure. Um, that's an excellent set of questions. And I always pair Aristotle with neuroscience. I do not make him my god. Um, he is he he just has a very thorough 
and nuanced understanding of what it means to to flourish and for aristotle moral virtues are not mindless habits because ultimately what he's saying about phronesis is that as we mature so you you learn as a child look both ways before you cross the street you know don't touch the stove you, you burn yourself you you hear about accidents you but you, you're doing it because you're supposed to and you're told to as you grow with maturity and experience um you also you also learn how to treat people with kindness you don't feel like it but you do it because you're taught to take turns and not hit people ahead with your doll when you're upset so with experience you learn why that matters you learn why that might hurt another person and that's where phronesis ke 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 kicks in and what you're doing in a socratic seminar or in a careful discussion in a nuanced discussion in a class whether you're talking about um theoretical and practical wisdom in wit is you're helping young people develop those habits of reflection that are critical to phronesis because you want them to connect knowing that something is good to knowing why something is good and owning it so that you freely choose in other contexts you choose well because it always matters what you're aiming at that's that's really what practicalism amounts to so i work very closely with jubilee center always have but if you look at um stress tests of character we're also doing another project called courageous conversations and uh, you look at our blog um mm. there's a there's a blog post building a life compass it's in very simple terms i i don't always use virtue you are my classical education audience i'm very happy talking about strengths um, I'm very happy, but again, it, the neuroscience shows that, you know, our brains develop from back to front. This is the prefrontal cortex. This is where the wisdom, the good judgment is. We know that in middle school, peak adolescence, it's slightly, it's different for girls and boys. The limbic system can be like swollen, you know, and that means it means slightly different things for boys and girls. There's a lot of, there is overlap, but that reaction and impulsive center needs to be tempered and educated. It's not just about waiting for someone to turn 21 before you can have an intellectual conversation with them. It's about setting those experiences in motion at home and in the classroom where we're training them to, to reflect. So we are kicking phrenesis into gear. So the way I look at Nicomachean ethics is I am drawing the instructive insights for educators. I'm not treating it as a sacred text from which I cannot bear. I don't know if that's helpful, but we could talk a lot. I don't no, know. it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I mean, that's the schooling of desire. I suppose. Correct. Correct. And that's really what, um, you know, I can send you something else on the schooling of desire. Well, the, uh, there's another parent on, in the same vein that wondered if you had suggestions for introductory reading for high schoolers on Aristotle or Plato. Oh, that's great. Um, yes. Um, well, I was thinking, I haven't read it all. I just started to read Edith Hall. And I think- no, I was just gonna ask you, I have Edith Hall. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's things I, there's a, what I like about Edith Hall is the way she addresses the fact that Aristotle, you know, had no respect for women or children with any kind of disabilities, et cetera. She addresses all of that. Like, what can we extract from Aristotle that is useful? Um, but another good primer on Aristotle is, um, in in process let me think about that um but let me think about that and get back to you i have another book i have not finished reading but it's called some i can't even remember the title but it's something like if aristotle had an ipad or something i mean it's very simple but um it it's an introduction Who's so maybe the, we put our heads together karen and, and give parents a list yeah there okay. is a fellow at notre dame um philosopher and motorcycle a mechanic he writes the book the world outside your head he's got some really good stuff on aristotle and there's someone else i don't know why i'm having this brain freeze right now but but i will remember as soon as we log off yeah exactly well this was great i i really enjoyed it and it, it's i'm sure the parents did as well we really want to thank you for taking the time 